spent a few years chasing the world record for 100 miles. <laughs> That's so crazy. <laughs> the first 100 miler I've controlled it is in 2013. 2014, I went after it. 15, I went after it once and missed. 17, I went after it once and missed. 2019, I went after it twice and on the second attempt got it. Failure is something I need to embrace as an opportunity to learn versus being just a, you know, a complete failure. If you stay motivated and give yourself enough opportunities, eventually those things are gonna line up. And if you trust your training and trust your process, then those things just kind of compound on one another until you've had enough opportunities to have a day. When I step away from the sport, will I be able to say I did the best I possibly could on these more controlled 100 mile races and know that I pushed my body to the limit? today's episode, I talk about pushing your limits with the ultra marathon runner and one time world record holder, Zach Bitter. Zach, I, I know that you started in track and field at university and all of that stuff, but how did you get into ultra marathon running? How did you get into the ultra side of the <laughs> running? And more importantly than how, why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think especially when I was younger, you know, the why was a lot of it was more directed towards just trying to find something that I was good at and that I could focus enough energy into that would kind of put me in a position where I had an identity more or less. I think we're all kind of seeking that to a degree and running was a pretty good vehicle for me to explore that through. Um, I was always really active as a kid. So I think just like finding something where I could express myself through like physical movement was definitely a bonus there. It was something that I had some success at relative to other sports. So maybe that's why running stuck out versus say, you know, a, a different team sport or a, um, one of the more traditional sports or things like that. But I think the why sort of evolves when you've been doing something like this, as long as I have, I think if you have this, it's rare, I would say that someone does ultra marathons for a decade plus, or you have folks who've done for multiple decades where you're kind of trans going from, I'm new and I'm learning the sport to now I know enough to really peak and find my max potential then to, I'm no longer as good as I once was, but I still want to participate and challenge myself in this sport. So these whys are going to like shift and evolve as you move through. So I try to think of my whys a little bit more multifaceted where I kind of have my big overreaching why, my career why, where what do I want to be able to look back on my running career and be able to see and think about when I'm no longer running races competitively? And then what do I want my why to be within the framework of, say, like a single season or a single year or even a specific type of event? Because ultra marathon is pretty diverse in the different types of terrain and different types of distances you can challenge yourself with. But then ultimately kind of paring down the why also to now I have this single training block or this week or even this day or single workout. So why am I doing this on a particular day? Because if I go out and do, say, three minute short intervals, I need a why for that as well as like because my why from a career standpoint isn't that motivating when I wake up in the morning and I don't want to do the three minute short intervals. So you need some short term whys as well. or some short term goals, motivators that are going to get you to kind of really push hard during those specific individual workouts to give yourself a reason to complete that one versus trying to think of like, I guess what you call like your legacy within a sport or within any discipline you're kind of challenging yourself in. Yeah. And, and that makes total sense, you know, as you mature within what you're doing and you know, the excitement wears off, the novelty probably wears off, the crowd who's like, ooh, you know, you're doing these amazing things <laughs> is like, well, you're like, I just did it again. And you're like, yeah, but you've already done it before. So we're not going to mm -hmm. celebrate you. And suddenly it just kind of loses its magic and its 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 mystique, so to speak. But yeah, mm -hmm. but you know, you've you've done like a huge career and so you've stuck with it time and time again, right? Yeah. And I think that's where ultra running gets a little interesting is you have folks who they'll come in and and they'll they'll finish something. And it's just like you said, they'll maybe they'll do a 50 mile and they're like, cool, now I did that. So what's next? What's the next challenge? What's the next thing? And then you also have folks where they decide, I really like this aspect of the sport and I want to see exactly how dialed in I can get at that specific one. So maybe it's a specific course that they really like and they want to do it every year so that at the end of their, their running career, they can say, okay, I remember that one year where everything lined up and I just executed things properly. And that's what they kind of hang their hat on at the end of the day. 
And I would say I probably fit somewhere in between there, but maybe lean a little more towards picking specific things. I've definitely identified kind of flat runnable hundred milers as an interesting, exciting event that I tend to peak for more often than not. So uh, for me, I think one of the whys definitely is just seeking that challenge of, you know, when I step away from the sport, will I be able to say I did the best I possibly could on these more controlled hundred mile races and, and, and know that I pushed my body to the limit within that. So that's a big, big piece of the puzzle for me, I think. So this is the second time just in the matter of, you know, a few minutes that you were talking about when you step away from the sport. So, so you, you think about legacy a lot then, do you, or is it just you're forward thinking all the time? And, um, cause it seems to me like you should be focused on, on your next challenge <laughs> as opposed to like, when I step away from this, what will I, what will I have? What will I have done? What will my legacy be? Or am I misunderstanding? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're not, you're not wrong. I think where I'm getting at with that is these things all kind of have peaks and then you have to kind of move on to something else, or you find yourself kind of living in the past. So I try to be forward thinking with what is that kind of the next stage in life or the next stage when I get to a point where the things that really drive me aren't necessarily going to be driving me in the same way. So like the where I maybe learned this the most was I spent a, a few years chasing the world record for 100 miles. And the big driver at the start of what does, that. What does a few years mean? Because 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 this is easy to gloss over where yeah. we just look at the highlight reels and we're like, oh, you know, like, great. You know, it was it was 11 hours and 42 minutes or whatever, whatever the exact time was. And but mm -hmm. what does a few years chasing actually mean? <laughs> Yeah, it was like probably about five and a half years. I, I did a hundred miler in 2013 where I went after the American record and broke it. And then I was like, oh, cool. I'm like not too far off from the world record. Maybe I should make that kind of a target. Did you know when you set out, even in that first time, if you could do it or not? Or like, how, how does how does one go about that? Yeah, I didn't necessarily think the world record was in play when I first went after the American record, or at least I hadn't given it enough thought to consider it. When I broke the American record, then I thought the world record was very much in play. In fact, I probably thought I was going to break it much sooner than I actually did. So uh, that's that's where that kind of drive came from, I think. And ultimately, though, since it took me longer than I originally expected, I, I had a little bit of evolution as to the why that I was doing it, where it became less about, I want to have a world record at the 100 mile to... I want to see how fast I can do this. I think the world record kind of comes along for the ride, but ultimately, regardless of how fast I run it, someone else is going to break it. In fact, someone already has. So it's, it's like one of those things where if you, I think if you, if you think about it from a practicality standpoint, these records are something that can be fun things to chase. But ultimately, if you decide I want to have a world record and then that be something that I define myself with, you're going to set yourself up for failure because ultimately someone's going to break it or you're going to live the interim between having that record and someone else breaking it, just dreading the time and the place where, where that actually ends up happening. So for me, I think I learned that along the way before I actually broke it, that I need to have other reasons to be doing this outside of just trying to break and hold a world record, or I would end up either being disappointed by not doing it or disappointed in doing it and then losing it ultimately. So how many attempts did it take? The first 100 miler at control that is in 2013, then 2014, I went after it once and missed. Uh, 15, I went after it once and missed. Uh, 17, I went after it once and missed. And 2018, I didn't realistically go after it in a controlled environment, um, but I did some flat runnable 100 miles where I thought in the back of mind, if things go just perfect, I could maybe get close. Uh, 2019, I went after it twice and on the second attempt got it. So I guess that'd be about four or five, depending on how you look at it. That's, that's, it's so, it's so many, right? Like, <laughs> like it's, it's so many like kicks at the can and this, this is what, this is what I, I like to focus on only because when I read your bio, when I see everything, it's like, oh, you know, this person got into this sport and achieved great things. It's, it's a bit like, uh, I don't know if you've ever sat down and spoken with an author. I love talking to authors mm -hmm. because I think most of us think of authors as people who write these amazing books. 
And they often say, like, if you saw the crap that I wrote, <laughs> that went through process after process, rewrite after rewrite, revision after revision, editor after editor, team after team to get the final product, it's like, it's, it's not there at all. Mm-hmm. And so as you're attempting each one of these, um, how does it not feel like you're continually failing? And how do you regroup in your mind for the next attempt, especially by the fourth or the fifth or the sixth miss. I mean, it's just miss after miss after miss. How does it not just become this unachievable goal for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think uh, where I maybe learned early well enough was that failure is something I need to embrace as an opportunity to learn versus being just a, you know, a complete failure. So uh, that was something where when I would have a race and not accomplish it, accomplish the goal. Sometimes the result was still quite good. So I was able to hang my hat on that, but also there were some pretty distinct areas where that is a spot I need to improve. And my curiosity and interest in the sport is, is high enough where I wanted to really kind of solve those tr- those problems. And I think that's maybe where that transition maybe went from chasing a, an arbitrary record or time goal to finding how fast I can do it, because that would mean finding how fast I can run hundred miles in a controlled environment means ironing out those mistakes, figuring out what went wrong, where I failed, where I, where all that stuff did and went, and that kind of became more of an interesting part of the process to me as I kind of went through it. So it kind of all really like came to a point where I understood exactly how powerful and impactful that stuff can be when I ultimately did break the record where I had points during that race where previous experiences, I hit those milestones and I was in a position to either go the direction I did when I made the mistakes or remedy it or correct it. And those stuck out in my mind as I kind of reflected on the, the rate, my, my race in 2019 that went quite a bit better. So when you have an opportunity to kind of learn from your mistakes in a way that actually bears fruit at a certain point, I think you just gain a little more appreciation, or at least you you confirm in your own mind that I wasn't just lip service saying, oh, failures are opportunities to learn. Because I mean, you can easily say that just to cope with a failure too. But ultimately, if you end up using those to have a meaningful progress forward, you've essentially proven to yourself that those were indeed something that were ne- necessary to kind of find your find your top end or whatever your best was on that that given day. And when the difference between you called it a miss and then later said failure, but the the difference between missing it and the time that you won it, was there really that much of a difference in terms of preparation, in terms of showing up, or was a lot of this just that things kind of lined up and went well? Because there's got to be a certain element of, you know, uh, of, where you are for ground sea level and how you're feeling and how you slept and how you ate and and the different the difference between failing and succeeding we often think is within our control but sometimes it's I don't want to say it's luck because you prepared like heck but but you tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and then you got it I got mm-hmm. to imagine that in some of those tries the difference between succeeding and failing was just like things just didn't work out mm-hmm. yeah no I think you're you're heading in the right direction with that. It's a, uh, I would say you, it's probably the way you maybe want to look at it is there's kind of the physical component. And then there's the mental component where I think the physical component, I've been in a position to have run a race like I did in 2019, but for whatever reason, the mental component wasn't there or the, the timing of it wasn't great. And then situations that were out of my control impacted me in a way that I, that didn't in 2019. So some of it, it's like, you're kind of creating your own luck in the sense that if you stay motivated and give yourself enough opportunities, eventually those things are going to line up. And if you trust your training and trust your process, then those things just kind of compound on one another until you've had enough opportunities to have a day like I did. So I think there's some things that are worth considering that are maybe a little bit different. Uh, um, one was, uh, you know, I was training in the heat in the summer in Phoenix. So like a lot of my peak training was in a hundred to 120 degrees. Whereas I raced in a 60 degree constant climate when I did the race itself. So were there some physical advantages of training in that heat and then stepping into a very, very ideal, like temperature climate to do the competition itself, probably move the needle to a degree. Uh, you know, you can look at it kind of like we said before too, like, had I not had a situation in 2015 where I was ahead of world record pace through 80 miles, 
and then had the wheels kind of start coming off a bit that last 20 miles and have the world record slip away. Do I not have that experience? Then am I viewing hitting mile 80 in 2019 the same way as I would had I had not had that experience? And instead of having the wheels come off, actually speed up and run faster that last 20 miles than I did any other 20 mile segment during the day. So there's a lot of like moving parts there. Uh, yeah. But that's what makes the sport interesting, right? You can sit down and you can tease out as much of the data as you can, and you can come up with your best guess as to what was the reason for it to happen on a specific day. But ultimately, there's going to be a bunch of things that you're aware of and some that you're not, and those are all going to combine to produce whatever results you ended up with. So uh, I embrace that uncertainty in the, some of those aspects because I think it's what makes the sport a little more exciting because then there is that variable of you just don't know. So you're running across America. Why? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good question. So I'll I have a little bit of an update on that. I have had to postpone that project. I actually injured my ankle a few weeks ago and got an MRI done. And I it turns out I, I had a couple of partial tears and some ligaments on both sides of my right ankle. Um, okay. So in in the mo- so you injure yourself. Yeah. You're like oh no, I've injured myself enough to go get an MRI. What did that feel like then? Yeah, it was interesting because I've been super fortunate and perhaps this is one of the reasons why I found luck or success within ultra running is this is only the second time in my ultra marathon career where I've had any injury that's removed a big goal race or project from my schedule where I have to kind of take a step back, let everything kind of catch up and then ease back into things. So that was a relatively new experience for me. I think my mindset with it was more positive than negative because I've learned to maybe appreciate that, you know, just watching other folks who tend, who have gotten injured more frequently have to deal with this sort of a thing on a yearly or every other year basis and knowing like, Hey, I've been incredibly fortunate to be sitting here 10, 11 years into this career and only having to work through these paces for the second time. Yeah. Uh, so part of it is just like thinking of ways to like look at the situation. Cause I'm in the situation. There's no way I can't go back and uninjure my ankle and do it the right way. So now did, that did a little part of you did a little part of you when you got, you know, this medical excuse, this medical outgo, like, <laughs> I don't have to do this now. Thank goodness. Yeah. Well, that is the other unique thing is uh, this project is big and different enough from what I have done where I was definitely going to have a lot of kind of learning to do in the event itself or the project itself. So there's definitely a piece of your mind that does go like, I can relax that now. So the, t- the stress and the tension of saying like, I have this date on the calendar at which I'm going to take a step forward in San Francisco that is hopefully going to lead to millions and millions of steps getting me to New York that no longer is creating any stress or anxiety in my mind that does get removed. Uh, But that's in combination with, oh, this is kind of a bummer because I did spend, you know, months kind of skewing my training towards this type of an activity versus what I would typically be doing for a single day ultra marathon. To get to your question about what's the why in running across the country, my why is I've got a really good friend and humanitarian who uh, has put his body through the ringer over years and sacrificed parts of his professional career as a fighter to help people who are more forgot, have been forgotten or who are, have lacked opportunities to be successful. And, uh, you know, to have to talk to him and say, Hey, we're going to do this, but it's just not going to happen this year because I'm not going to be able to get across the country in one piece. Or if I do, it's going to be at such a compromised pace that, we're maybe not going to raise the amount of awareness and attention that we would like to do in order to kind of give your, give your foundation a boost. Yeah, but That that feels like a philanthropic why, as opposed mm -hmm. to like what compels someone to say, I'm going to run across America. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so I guess I'll rewind a little bit. So before I even knew who Justin Renner fight for the forgotten was, which is the charity and the founder, uh, I had this idea of, I want to run a transcontinental run. It was actually naivety yet for the most part. I mean, I was pretty early in my, my running, my ultra marathon running career where I can't remember what actually brought it to my attention. I, I must've been told about someone or read a story about someone who had just done it. And I thought, man, that's cool. I'm going to do that someday. So it was just like this way, way, way in the distant kind of like pipe dream goal and then uh, in 2016, it kind of got reignited a little bit. One of my friends, uh, Pete Kostelnik, he went and he ran 
that particular route and broke the record. So he improved what was a 66 mile per day average to a 72 and a half mile per day average. So that kind of like reintroduced it to the front of my mind was like, okay, yeah, maybe I should start thinking about that project again. And, and right, like shortly thereafter that, like a year or two after that, I met Justin and that was maybe the piece of the puzzle that I was lacking at the point. I don't think uh, I would necessarily be able to do it at a high enough caliber to chase Pete's record if it was just for me to see how fast I can get across the country, which is maybe a deviation from where I think I can do in these single day races where I can very much go into a hundred mile race and think I'm doing this for me. <laughs> and that can be enough motivation. Yeah. Whereas I, I just had this, this feeling where there's going to be a part, maybe I'm, it's through Colorado or something like that, where if this is all about me, I'm going to have an opportunity to, take a step back and go a little slower when I don't physically actually need to. So I need another why on top of my own personal reasons and Justin's charity and his life goals and things were kind of that piece of the puzzle that would give me this, this extra push when I got to that point, that would be inevitable in my mind. Yeah. Like there's almost this sense of like obligation Mm -hmm. that you'd be letting others down if you, if you don't continue to push. Right. Right. Yeah. And when you think about just, just the way it's kind of structured too, where his particular foundation is focused on building wells for the pygmy tribe over in Africa. And, and, you know, he's done a lot of work for them to essentially what comes out to freeing up half of their population to do other things other than spend all day gathering clean water. Whereas it's just a really interesting thing. Cause like, I mean, we take it for granted here because we turn on a faucet and we have clean water. Whereas so then we can spend all day podcasting and, you know, running and <laughs> running. Doing all this, yeah, doing all these, these other things, these like higher on the hierarchy of need type of things, uh, which is great. But like, if we had to go and actually gather clean water, you know, essentially probably, you know, half of our community would spend their day doing just that. And that's kind of where the pygmy were. They were like the women essentially were saddled with the, the obligation of going and getting clean water and they spend all day doing it. So once they have a well where they can just draw with it from that in, in minutes versus hours, yeah. now it's like, well, we've got this, this, this talent pool or this labor force or however you want to look at it that just went from needing to do this to now we can have them do whatever we want. So now that gives them an opportunity to do more yeah. home building, structure building, farm building, things like that. So, you know, when you think about it from that framework, where if I get to a point, in, it's almost just like, living, living down, like your sense of like, uh, of ability to decide for yourself. So if I find myself in Colorado thinking, well, I really think maybe 60 miles would be good today, even though in the back of my head, knowing I could eke out 75. If you think of it, like, oh, if one of those women from the pygmy tribe got, you know, three fourths of the way back to their village with that big jug of water, she has no choice, but to go that rest of the way, they've got to do it. Like, so you kind of try to put yourself in that situation mentally, even though physically you you aren't technically. I love that lever, like that lever action, like that putting yourself in a position where you have to do it. You know, I, in the spring I did, um, I did a health challenge. It was supposed Mm -hmm. to be 90 day. It became a 120 day health challenge where, which is, which is part of why I lost the weight I lost. And I, and I started doing strength training, but you know, I got a personal trainer, I got a nutritionist, I ate exactly what they wanted, when they wanted me to eat it for 90 days straight down to the 0.1 of an ounce, Mm -hmm. uh, like time of day, water, all that stuff. And every day I'm just like, "Ah, 65 days to go. (laughs) And then it's like, but when I hit the 45 day mark, the halfway through, I was just like, I'm on the other side of this. Great. But then it was like 36 days to go. 26, eight days to go. And as it went on and on and got harder and harder, and they cut me more and more and more. And, you know, I'm working out more and more and more. It's just so boring and so repetitive and so um, not exciting. And the results are good, but it's just like, it's not enough for me. And then knowing it's just like, if I mess up, I've thrown this, that what you talked about, the training, right? Like if I mess up, I've just thrown this whole thing away. Mm -hmm. If I don't do it, how can I stand at the end and not be a liar? Like if I don't, and so that framework made me really disciplined and it got a lot out of me. And then the challenge ended and it was like so hard to stick with these things that uh-huh. I've, that I've done, like that I did. And, and my wife even was just like, Mark, I don't understand. You were so disciplined. Now, now you're struggling to like do any of this stuff. 
And so as you cycle through your training and your level of discipline and what you think about yourself and how you define yourself, I think often we look at people who do what you do and we think that there's this consistent level, that there's this like rock star level that you achieve, that you hit this monk level, and then you don't dip in or out. But I mean, you're, you're a regular guy, right? I, I mean, you do extraordinary things, but I'm sure you admit that you're, you know, that you do these things. What are the ups and downs like as you cycle through the months or the years or in and in, into discipline and out of discipline? Or are you able to just hit this level and stay there? Yeah, I really like this topic because I think you can almost be too disciplined in this sport and probably all sports to the point where you crave that peak fitness which ultimately, you know, we live in a time where enough people have done these things where to actually be peak fit for an event, it's unsustainable to be there year round. It's just not something your body can tolerate. So like the training and preparation that is required for me to get ready to peak for a hundred mile, if I would do that year round, I would fizzle out and burn out. And fortunately for me, I've seen enough people do that where I know where that road leads. So I know, okay, I can't go down that road, which puts me in a position where I need to structure my calendar year or even years in a way where I'm peaking and then taking some off season, letting myself actually get less fit and then work back up to it. So you're hitting these points, maybe it's two or three points every year where you're at that unsustainable level of fitness that you can just capture once with a race and then, all right, let's reset. And that's the hardest thing I think is letting go of that peak fitness because you get all this motivation and all this excitement and all this uh, just good feeling from making progress point after progress point in a training plan to where you feel like you can do anything. You're like, okay, I can go and hit this workout, which is just as fast or faster than I've ever done it before. I can go and do this and feel good. And I can hit these paces. Now you have to accept this point where when I start structuring training again, maybe that's in two weeks or three weeks or whatever happens to be. I'm going to have deprogrammed enough. I'm going to have maybe gained two or three pounds. Uh, I'm going to you know, be in a position where now all those peaks that I could hit, whether it's my pace at an easy run, whether it's how much ground I can cover in a four minute interval, or how fast can I get up that climb that I've been using as a, as a checkpoint in my training, all sinks down. So you can look at that in a negative way where it's like, okay, I'm less of a person than I was a few weeks ago or a month ago. Or what I like to do is think of it as, okay, I was at a point in my fitness where in order to improve the, the, the visibility of that on paper would have been such a small, tiny little margin. It's really hard to know that you actually made an improvement. So when you let not, not only is letting go of that peak fitness and building back up going to be good for your long-term sustainability and health, But it's also going to put you in a position where now when you start the process over again, you have a bigger gap to fill, which means bigger improvement markers, more recognizable improvement markers, which are where I like to draw a lot of that day-to-day motivation from or that week-to-week motivation from is, am I running at my aerobic threshold a little bit faster than I was two weeks ago? And if the answer is yes, I can get excited about that. I can be like, cool, I'm heading in the right direction. The process is starting again. This is, uh, you know, maybe this time I'm going to find a new plateau within that intensity spectrum and, and uh, get all this kind of like, like shorter term motivation or what I like to call kind of the small wins that you kind of build into like a training process. So what is that voice telling you when, because it's not, it's not your voice, it's your voice, but it's not your voice. What, what, what is that voice? What are the words? that that voice is telling you when you're starting to spiral on the negative side? Yeah, I think it's just like one thing leading to another. So at first it's like, oh, I just fell out of my pace range. And then it's like, seems what if I- enough, right? Seems right. like totally not a big deal, right? You know, you uh-huh. can get it back. So it's one lap. It's one lap. Yeah, yeah. you're going to have some that fall out of range, just like I'm going to have some that are faster. And then it's going to, in a good day, it's all going to average out to be within that range you're targeting. So like, first it's like, okay, it's one lap. And then you start thinking, well, what if one lap turns into two laps, five laps, 10 laps, how many, then you start kind of thinking how many of these suboptimal laps can I afford? What if it gets Mm -hmm. up to 20? At what point do I, and you just kind of start thinking forward negatively. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get in a problem, I think, because when you start thinking forward negatively too far, you start trying to wrap your head around 60 miles in my case, which is going to be just too much. Like one of the things you have to learn in these hundred mile races 
is how to pace yourself properly, but not be thinking of the entirety of it at any given moment so that you're able to chunk it into small enough bite-sized pieces where you can actually uh, stay sane more or less. <laughs> right. And when you let that negative thought process that I described spiral up to the point where how many laps can I afford to go too slow before I don't have enough room within this 60 miles to make up for it. Now I'm trying to digest too much. It's like I tried to swallow that whole steak versus just having one bite of it at a time <laughs> is the way that I kind of view that. And, and you could have that spin in the other direction too, the positive side. And you have to be careful there too, because if I start getting kind of on the fast end where I'm just like pushing up against that fast end of the lap, that can be good. And I need to take advantage of that. But if I get kind of greedy there and say, oh, maybe I'm in better shape than I thought I was, maybe I should readjust this window and scale it down a couple seconds per lap. Now I might be putting myself in a position to run miles 40 to mile 70 so fast that 70 to hundred become physically undoable because I overreached my capabilities from the physical standpoint. And I ended up giving back all that time too. So I think a lot of this has, uh, has a lot to do with how do you kind of put yourself through those paces that you're going to see on race day in your training and your preparation without being able to actually do it? Because that's what makes hundred milers so unique in the endurance world is, you know, I could go out and replicate even a marathon fairly closely to race day. I can get within probably three fourths, maybe four fifths of the actual race day setting and not overtax my body too much. If I kind of structure the recovery properly for a hundred miler, there's just no way I'm going to go out and do say an 80 mile training run at goal, hundred mile race and have that play out the way I would want it from a stress recovery standpoint. So ultimately you need to find ways to work on that kind of mental process in training without actually physically doing it. So you have to kind of disconnect those two things. Whereas I think with a lot of other endurance events, you can kind of connect those two in training and yeah. really see those work together. Whereas in training, you kind of have to hack it where maybe I'll do back-to-back -back long runs where I'm running 60, 70 miles in two days. And by the end of that second day, my body's beat up enough where I can kind of appreciate what it's going to feel like at mile 70 or something like that. But there still leaves that little bit of wonderment there, I think. But yeah. uh, that's one thing that I really learned in that buildup that ended up playing a huge role for me that I hadn't really done a whole lot of in the past. When I did, it was more on accident. It was a little more intentful, I think, in this buildup where I probably did like six or eight long runs where all I was really visualizing during those long runs was, uh, you know, being at that end part of a hundred mile or so if it was a 30 mile long run, like I'm going to visualize being at mile 70 on this run and just work through the mental paces of that. Uh, throughout this 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 long run and treat it as if I were actually doing it. So then you're kind of doing a dress rehearsal for your mind that you can eventually connect to the physical in the moment when you get to the race itself. Yeah. Okay. Last question for you. At the end of the day, it all comes down to what? At the end of the day, I mean, I think it all comes down to just being authentic to myself, I guess, in the sense that like, I find that as I get older, I learn more about where my like true motivations are. So sometimes it can be easy to gravitate back towards what maybe a prior motivation was or a prior goal was and put a little too much weight on that. So sitting down or giving myself the opportunity to sit down and actually think about like really at the core, what is going on here and why, and answering that question. And if that question is answered in, I am doing the things I want to do, then I can you know rest easy at night and continue on. Whereas if I got to a point where I did that and was like, you know what, I'm just not excited to do this anymore. There's something else that gets me way more excited, way more motivated. I think I can give more here then, you know, that'll be the time where it's time to kind of shift goals or shift priorities to a degree. But so far, you know, every time I've done that, I've still gotten to the point where it's like, I think I've got a faster hundred mile in me. You know, I think I've got some other events I haven't gotten even close to potentially maximizing in that I would like to explore a bit. And, you know, those things have always just really ignited excitement in me. So at that point, like then I'm being authentic to myself. I'm going after those things that excite me, that make me really want to kind of get up and put in the work every day.